will now move on <laughs> to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last session, I raised the issue of human trafficking. It's an issue that one police officer called in Nova Scotia a hidden epidemic. One brave mother recently came forward to explain the devastating impact human trafficking has had on her daughter and her family, and I will table that story. When I raised this issue with the Premier last March, he said it will take all of us to move this issue forward. But the mother says victims of human trafficking don't know what services are even available to them. So I will ask the Premier, will he commit today to make an effort to ensure their program appropriate departments promote services available to human trafficking victims to the appropriate agencies and organizations. The Honourable Premier. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Mr. Speaker, I believe uh, that has been ongoing through the Department of Justice, through to HRP, RCMP across the province, but Mr. Speaker, I will uh, make sure uh, that we reiterate uh, that to them. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Statistics Canada says that Halifax actually has a higher number of police reported human trafficking violations between 2009 and 2016 than cities like Hamilton, Edmonton, Calgary. But unfortunately, there have been only a handful of convictions. So Tony Pizanza, a criminal lawyer in Vancouver, says that the number of convictions could be improved by better support systems for victims, and I'll table this information. I would like to know how the Premier plans to act um, now to get justice for these victims of human trafficking and how he imp uh, plans to improve these services. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank you, Honourable for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we continue to invest in victim services, uh, Mr. Speaker, ensuring that there's a relationship between Department of Justice and public policy initiatives that have gone out to law enforcement agencies across the province. As I said during my earlier question, we'll continue to make sure that that information has gone on. I believe that has been ongoing, continues to ongoing between the department and uh, the Department of Justice. Uh, but I will uh, uh, ensure the honourable member that uh, the Minister of Justice and I will recommit uh, to making sure that information is in the appropriate agencies. The honourable leader of the official opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Premier for that answer. I appreciate it. But many victims. Victim services in Nova Scotia um, only assist people actually of certain gender or above a certain age. Heather Harmon, the CEO for Halifax's um, Open Door Centre, says the lack of direct services for trafficking survivors led to the centre's help program. Harmon says one of the most significant ways to turn this around is to raise awareness with our youth. So I will ask the Premier, will he ensure all victims of human trafficking in Nova Scotia receive the services and supports they need regardless of their age or gender? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. She is right, uh, Mr. Speaker. We, uh, through the Department of Justice, uh, Victim Services, there are certain criteria in around that. Uh, uh, with that in mind, we know uh, there are some who have been in this, uh, caught in this human trafficking situation, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that are under the agency wide uh, Department of Community Services is working to ensure that we're providing the supports. Uh, around uh, those young people, uh, supports uh, not only, quite frankly, to give them the support to get healthy again, uh, but to ensure that we are protecting them from those, Mr. Speaker, who want to continue to drive uh, these people into the human trafficking network, and we're going to continue to make sure that we make those investments uh, to help protect our, uh, our children. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. A few months ago, when nursing homes in the province were required to report on incidents of bed sores in their facilities, people were alarmed to learn that there were 152 cases of stage three and bed, uh, stage four bed sores in the nursing homes of the province. And this week, we in the NDP uh, were alarmed to learn, uh, as a result of a Freedom of Information inquiry, that counting stage one and two bed sores uh, in July, our nursing homes in Nova Scotia reported a total of 621 bed sores. Now, bed sores are preventable injuries. Now, does the Premier not also find it alarming that we've got 621 incidents of bed sores in the long-term care facilities of the province? Premier. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's why we've put together, Mr. Speaker, that committee of experts to go out to, to deal with, to talk to long-term care facilities and uh, dealing with this uh, very issue. We're looking forward to come back uh, with uh, uh, their advice uh, based on evidence, uh, and uh, we look forward to getting that report. As I said to earlier, now remember that report uh, will be in uh, near the end of November. Uh, we look forward to that as we begin to build our budget towards uh, next year uh, to ensure that if there are recommendations associated with that, uh, that we can deal with them. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. When we face in the province a problem of this magnitude, we naturally look to the government and see what has been done to alleviate it. I would not say that taking $5 million out of the funds of nursing homes over the last four years was a way to improve this situation. And I would also not say that holding staffing levels constant over the five years of this administration has been a very good way of addressing this problem either. So I want to ask the Premier, does he think that his government's approach to funding nursing homes has led to improvements with this bed sore problem? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for his uh, uh, question and his opinion and his thoughts about what we should do, uh, Mr. Speaker. I will put that and I'll hang on to that until I hear back from the experts, Mr. Speaker, in the field, and I will put his thoughts in and around the advice we received from those experts, and I'm sure we'll come up with a, uh, 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 an approach. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. A great deal of information is available on this problem at the moment. We know, for example, that in Ontario, the incidence of bed sores is 2.7%, uh, and that they're working hard to get that down by third, two-thirds to a benchmark of 1%. But in Nova Scotia, the incidence of bed sores today is three times that almost, 7%, and we don't have any publicly posted benchmarks whatsoever about this. So I want to ask the Premier, in a province with a bed sore incidence rate that equals one in 14 of the residents we have in our province's nursing homes, why in the world do we not have any benchmarks for dealing with this problem? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you for the question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as I said to him in uh, my first answer, uh, we've reached out uh, to a panel of experts, Mr. Speaker, who put together recommendations. How do we address uh, the issue uh, of bed sores and other issues in and around long-term care, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to assure the Honourable Member uh, we're taking this issue very seriously and we look forward to the recommendations coming back from the experts. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Premier told reporters he made a mistake in 2013 when he said the Privacy Commissioner should be given more authority and more independence. He said that now that he knows more, he thinks the office has all the power and independence it needs. Apparently, he learned the commissioner needs less independence than every other privacy commissioner in the country. They all are independent officers of the legislature. What information has the Premier learned about Nova Scotia's privacy commissioner that warrants giving her less independence than her colleagues across this country? The Honourable Premier. What I, what I learned, Mr. Speaker, is that when you had a responsible, reasonable government in place, Mr. Speaker, they look and take the recommendations that come forward uh, from the officer and implement them. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. So let's just refresh here. Back in 2013, on the eve of the election, the Premier signed a letter saying that if he was elected, he would make the Privacy Commissioner an independent officer of the Legislature. Yesterday, he told reporters that despite that written promise, he did not run on that commitment and doesn't understand why he should be held accountable to it. He reiterated that, despite what he said in 2013, he has no plans to make the Privacy Commissioner an independent officer of the Legislature. So I will ask, how are Nova Scotians supposed to know which promises the Premier really means? The ones, the ones in his platform, like a doctor for every Nova Scotian, or the ones he signs his name to? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I appreciate uh, the question from the Honourable Member again as I go back uh, to tell the Honourable Member what we discovered in 20, late 2013 was when you have a reasonable government in place, Mr. Speaker, and you respond in an open, transparent way to provide information to Nova Scotia. It's not necessary, quite frankly, to have someone at the officer, uh, uh, officer 
I, I will continue to make sure that we make the decisions and information available. And as I said, we hit the recommendations uh, that uh, the officer has continued to bring forward. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to continuing to make sure that we provide good government to the people of Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure the honourable member would remember she asked me a question last week. Province of Nova Scotia upgraded to double A minus, Mr. Speaker, from A plus overall improvement in the finance of the province, the highest credit rating this year to the province, Mr. Speaker. That's data that I want to I want to table for you, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure she also knows, Mr. Speaker, today. She also knows today when we made an announcement around the cultural help. Order, please. Say, order, order, please. The time allotted for the answer has expired. The the honourable member for Cape Breton Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. I heard last week from a Glace Bay resident who is at the end of her rope when it comes to the staff ratios in nursing homes. Her mother, who has dementia, has suffered four unwitnessed falls in her nursing home over the course of the past three months. Each of these falls could have been prevented had there been appropriate staff on hand. Unfortunately, that was not the case, and as a result, this elderly woman has been hospitalized four times since July. Mr. Speaker, the minister has had two health budgets to make improvements. Why hasn't he increased funding to bring staffing in our nursing homes to a safe level? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, the member's question. As the member would know, we've uh, convened a panel of uh, three experts uh, with experience uh, uh, in, in the area of long-term care. Mr. Speaker, uh, they are going to be looking at a variety of aspects uh, within the long-term care environment to provide some recommendations. Uh, we expect to, to hear back from them uh, by the end of November. And Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to uh, let the member uh, opposite know that over the uh, past uh, three or four years, uh, in fact, the uh, overall budget for long-term care services in her continued care has increased, uh, Mr. Speaker, not decreased, as she's asserted. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Actually, Mr. Speaker, the, the uh, budget for long-term care has decreased by $5 million, and that's no bet, no um, comfort to this, to this daughter who's mother has fallen four times in a Glace Bay nursing home. Mr. Speaker, while I look forward to the result of the Minister's expert panel, with all due respect, had this government been listening to the voices of residents, their loved ones, and nursing home staff and administrators for the past five years, instead of cutting $5 million from the budget, they wouldn't have to need to convene one. Rather than showing some leadership, this government has been allowing seniors to suffer preventable injuries like bed sores and falls, and that is disgraceful. Mr. Speaker, will the minister apologize to the residents of long-term care and their family members for neglecting their well-being? The Honourable Minister of Health. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member uh, for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I believe the, uh, the steps we've taken uh, to uh, investigate and respond to uh, the uh, concerns around uh, pressure injuries uh, in uh, our long-term care facilities has been well received. I've been out to a number of uh, long-term care facilities this summer uh, to uh, speak to uh, staff within those facilities as well as uh, the administrators to hear how uh, the work uh, that's been done, the, the educational information, the materials, uh, additional supplies, Mr. Speaker, all positive steps forward uh, to help them providing uh, enhanced care to uh, the residents of our long-term care facilities. And this work is uh, ongoing and continuing. Order, please. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health has the floor. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, as I'd said, uh, the work that's uh, ongoing will continue. We have the long-term care panel that we appointed a few weeks ago. Look forward to their feedback and recommendations on how to improve the quality of care uh, within our long-term care facilities. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. My question is for the Premier. Uh, we all know how this Liberal government insisted, contrary to professional advice, including uh, from the NSLC, that co-location of alcohol and cannabis retail was the best thing for Nova 
Scotians. Now it appears that decision could have real legal repercussions for anyone working for the NSLC. Last week, an official from the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency indicated that any Canadian involved with cannabis um, will basically risk a lifetime travel ban from the United States. And the official stated, if you work for the cannabis industry, that is grounds for inadmissibility. And I'll table that. So working at the NSLC, Mr. Speaker, wasn't always a risk factor uh, for a U.S. travel ban, but this government's decision to co-locate means it will come October 17th. So my question is, uh, what does his government, what does the Premier uh, plan to tell NSLC employees, from retail staff to executives, who are denied entry to the United States because of cannabis and alcohol the co-location? Honorable Premier. Speaker, let me be clear with the Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker. Cannabis is going to be legal and someone is going to be selling in the province of Nova Scotia. We've chose to use, Mr. Speaker, the NSLC. We'll continue to work with our partners, uh, both uh, the national level and they deal with both the U.S. government to ensure that we continue to have a smooth uh, passage between our two borders, Mr. Speaker. Um, hopefully, we'll get a NAFTA deal that will deal with goods and services and we'll continue to make sure that we build on our partnership of growing tourism. The Honourable Member would know we're now in our third consecutive year of record numbers of tourism from the United States. I want to I want to tell her that I want to tell her that vessel that they voted against each and every time has been an important part of that down in Yarmouth. We're going to continue to make sure uh, that we build on those relationships. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, this Premier decided to ignore all consequences of co-location. Beyond risk to the public health, the Premier seems content to put the liberty of NSLC employees at risk. Workers in the cannabis industry, including anyone employed by the NSLC, will not be permitted to enter the United States. However, they can apply for a waiver from their lifetime ban for a mere $585 US, and it only takes several months to process. The Premier is such an international travel enthusiast, so I'm sure that um, he would be irritated by this situation as well. Will the Premier commit to covering the cost of any travel ban waivers filed by NSLC employees, in addition to compensating them for the cost of any broken travel plans as a result the Honourable of the Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank I want to thank the Honourable Member for the Speaker. What we provided to Nova Scotia Liquor and Corporate Employees is another uh, another product to sell, Mr. Speaker. Unlike the leader of the uh, official opposition, her party, who were going to provide them a pink slip when they privatized it. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, uh, question for the Minister of Transportation. Uh, Road in Lunenburg County, Crescent Point or Crescent Beach Road has been tendered for repaving, and this road runs along Crescent Beach. The project requires that before paving, repaving can commence, approximately 60 truckloads of sand will need to be removed from the beach. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is something I, I thought would have happened in the old days. Um, I can think of a beach behind the house I grew up in uh, where a lot of sand was removed and, and the beach was ruined. Um, so I can't imagine it happening this day and age. Um, did the Minister of Transportation receive permission from his colleague at Lands and Forests before tendering the project? And if so, could he table that document? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member opposite for the question. And uh, I, I would just uh, uh, say that uh, in, in uh, Nova Scotia, and in this government, we value the beaches of Nova Scotia, and I would point the member to his own constituency, where a wonderful beach has been converted into two of the most successful golf courses in the world, and rated internationally, which is a good example of the proper use of resources in communities. Thank you. The Honourable Minister, uh, member for Inverness. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can assure you that in the construction of those two courses, there were not 60 truckloads of sand removed from the beach. Um, but I do agree with him. It was a good, uh, it's, they've been very successful, those courses. Uh, Crescent Beach is about 50 metres wide, and that includes a two-lane road. There's open ocean on one side and a saltwater marsh on the other. Needless to say, the road work will be done very close to the water. Yesterday, in response to a question on this topic from the member from Dartmouth North, the minister stated that the Department of Environment advises on many of these considerations. 
However, a spokesperson from the Department of Environment has stated on this issue that the Environment Department does not require an environmental assessment for a repaving project. Can the Minister and the Minister of Environment or the Acting Minister of Environment explain what input the Department has given to the Department of Transportation on the repaving of Crescent Beach Road and why an environmental assessment was not warranted? The Honourable Minister of Lands and Forestry. Yes, Mr. Speaker, uh, this, this doesn't trigger an environmental assessment. There are certain requirements in terms of how, how much the, how long the road is and the width of the road. Uh, in, in terms of the lands of forestry, it doesn't violate the Beaches Act either. Um, as we said, our government is embarking on consultation for a Coastal Protection Act that will be forthcoming in the next uh, year or so. It's important that we recognize that sometimes people have built uh, houses and indeed roads in some of these areas that are uh, open to uh, sea level rises and things of that nature. Uh, in this particular circumstances, there, there, are, there is sand that is going over the road. The road is not in an ideal location, but we have to provide safety for the patrons that are going across that road. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Richmond. Mr. Speaker, in the last sitting, the stories of Danny Latimer and Liz Cole made their individual journeys to access palliative care in Cape Breton, Richmond, real. The Latimers and Coles heard the Premier loudly and clearly when he said that what happened to them was completely unacceptable. The Premier committed to ensuring that the appropriate meetings would happen with Straight Richmond Palliative Care, and he personally accepted the plan needed to meet the needs of the palliative care patients in the constituency. Rather than meeting with the Straight Richmond Palliative Care Society, the Minister, on the eve of this House sitting, <coughs> instead sent them a letter directing them to contact the staff at the NSHA. Would the minister please explain, after five months, why the best he could do for the Straight Richmond Palliative Care Society was to advise them to call the health authority? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As the member would know, the Nova Scotia Health Authority is responsible for uh, the implementation of... Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority is responsible for frontline operations, the delivery of uh, health care services uh, throughout the province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the most efficient uh, and appropriate uh, course of action uh, for uh, the individual group to uh, discuss both the current uh, level of service and uh, opportunities for uh, changes or uh, desired changes, Mr. Speaker, would be directly to the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, because that would be step one, Mr. Speaker. The Health Authority would assess that in the context of their overall overall review of palliative uh, services. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Richmond. Mr. Speaker, perhaps uh, the Minister needs to be reminded that actually he is responsible ultimately for the Nova Scotia Health Authority. <laughs> In their meeting with me, the Cole family specifically spoke of the stark differences in palliative care services in the 10-year span between the death of their father and then their mother earlier this year. They previously did not have to fight for a bed to care for their dying father as they did their mother, and they did not have to endure the pain of seeing their father not have the same access to services as their mother. The integrated patio of care strategy planning for action in Nova Scotia was released in May of 2014 and it included 37 recommendations to improve and enhance access to palliative care services in Nova Scotia. Please, Mr. Speaker, it's 2018. Would the minister please detail how many of those 37 recommendations have been accepted and implemented? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member would know the Health Authority has uh, been working to uh, improve the uh, palliative services uh, throughout the province. We have a number of initiatives within this province, which includes a combination of services within hospitals, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's a hospital, uh, sorry, a hospice framework uh, that's been developed, Mr. Speaker. We have uh, communities uh, pursuing those options in their community. There are at-home uh, palliative options as well, Mr. Speaker, which are supported uh, communities community-based, and, and in addition, a, a feature, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, services being provided in partnership with EHS uh, to provide paramedic supports uh, in communities across the province as well. So, Mr. Speaker, we're working with uh, frontline health care providers working within their scopes of practice to provide the supports that families need in uh, providing end-of-life care. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Lands and Forestry. 
This past week gives the impression that the Minister's department is in disarray. First, the Minister says staff need more time to review Bill Leahy's recommendations. Then staff sent an email to industry advising on ways to reduce clear-cutting on Crown land. And now the Minister is distancing himself from that letter, saying no decision has been made, and especially no decision that would cost industry money. So, can the Minister clarify whether his department agrees with Mr. Leahy that clear-cutting on Crown land must be significantly reduced. The Honourable Minister of Lands and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the question. Uh, we have yet to officially respond to the full report in its retire entirety. Uh, of course, staff will continue to communicate with licensee holders, and that's what that email is about. Uh, there has been some advice and some and some talk about it, uh, some recommendations on how they would uh, go towards ecological-based forestry. It is a mandate within the department, has been for some time, to look for ways that we can reduce clear cutting where warranted, but uh, clear cutting or overstory, overstory removal will continue to be part of the forestry industry, as acknowledged in the Leahy report. We look forward to continuing to, to work with staff and our stakeholders to ensure that we are protecting the environment, but at the same time, growing our industry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, the Leahy report found that the department has not been considering wildlife as part of our forests, and it called for that to change. As confirmation that that change is required, last week we learned of a proposed cut in, on Crown land in West Hants that threatens vital winter habitat, not just for deer, but also an area where we know that endangered mainland moose and at-risk American martins also find refuge during the winter months. The minister and his department are sending mixed messages about whether and when we can expect forestry practices to change. And so my question is, why can't the minister commit right now to acting on Mr. Leahy's recommendation that impacts on wildlife be properly assessed? The Honourable Minister of Lands and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, wildlife is part of the 45 recommendations to, uh, to talk about uh, in our current pre-treatment assessments. Our biologists go out and we look at uh, any uh, opportunities that we can to mitigate any uh, potential impact to our wildlife and in particular our endangered species. I know that this particular stand has had a modification to its uh, original pretreatment assessment. Uh, it is up for public submissions. I look forward to uh, those submissions and we'll make the decision based on the science. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Unfortunately, I rise again on behalf of my constituents who are concerned about how this government is undermining health care at the Roseway Hospital. Last week, I rose in this house to ask the minister specifically about the future of Roseway Hospital. He has deferred and he has talked around the issue. To be honest, maybe it's not his decision to make, given the minister sat quietly by and watched the Premier deal the fatal blow to both Northside General and New Waterford Hospitals. Mr. Speaker, my question is, will he give me his word today that for as long as he is the Premier of Nova Scotia, the Roseway Hospital will be an open, full-service hospital? A simple yes or no is all I'm looking for. The Honourable Premier. Speaker, again, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to thank the Minister of Health for the tremendous work that he's been doing across the province. <laughs> Speaker, I want to assure that member and all members of this House, the Minister of Health, as all members of this, of this government, have input in the decisions that we are made, uh, that are made by our, our government, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is, I am the Premier. When we make a decision that has impacted the way it was, where we were making the kind of investments we were, I was going to go down and stand in that community to make that decision. In no way did it say that the Minister of Health is not part of that. And it's unfortunate that this early on in her career, she's chosen to go down the path of trying to insult the Minister of Health. Queen Shelburne. I was simply just asking a question, not being disrespectful. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. It's not just noise my constituents don't have a family doctor, and it's not just noise that my constituents have to travel hours away from, e from their home to sit 10 and 12 hours to access an ER because the one at home is closed. It's not just noise that my constituents are worried about an essential foundation of their great community being dismantled piece by piece by this government. These are not cherry-picked concerns. These are real-life concerns from my proud constituents of Queen Shelburne. My question to the Minister of Health, again, is, 
Will he join me and the people of Shelburne County at the People Over Politics rally on September 22nd so he can hear from the concerned residents a simple yes or no, it's not an essay question. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member uh, for bringing the concerns of her, uh, res her constituents. Order, please. Uh, the Honourable Minister of Health has the floor. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, again, uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for bringing the concerns of her constituents to the floor of the legislature. I'm pleased to, to remind the member that, in fact, uh, her uh, community is not being ignored. In fact, uh, we're investing, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's a collaborative uh, care uh, practice uh, uh, centre uh, being uh, built, to Mr. Speaker, in our community community, uh, which should be opening its doors very soon to uh, make new infrastructure available to the physicians uh, within that community, providing primary care uh, to her uh, residents of that area, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority continues to work uh, with recruitment initiatives, uh, both for uh, locum uh, supports uh, when there are temporary uh, uh, vacancies to be filled, Mr. Speaker. As a province, we've invested in uh, enhancing the locum opportunities, Mr. Speaker, to make it more attractive uh, to attend to the these vacancies, uh, temporary vacancies, throughout the province. Mr. Speaker, we are working, we're working with our partners, not just for her constituents, but all Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is also to the Minister of Health. I draw the attention of the House to the dysfunctional state of health care in Cape Breton. This past Saturday morning, a young girl from Sydney Mines, four years old, wound up with a foreign object in her eye. The Northside General Emergency Room was closed. The Cape Breton Regional Hospital emergency room was backed up, so they had to travel over 40 minutes to the emergency room deck. They sat there waiting to see a family doctor, but finally they did. So after hearing this story, can the minister tell me that his so-called investments in Cape Breton healthcare have improved the system? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, as the member uh, may be able to appreciate, uh, I'm not aware of every uh, incident that uh, or uh, presentation that uh, Nova Scotians make in, in emergency rooms uh, throughout uh, the province, so I'm not familiar with the uh, specific circumstances uh, the member's uh, referring to. What I can uh, highlight for the member is that, of course, there's significant investments coming to Cape Breton, building uh, new uh, collaborative uh, practices, uh, primary health care uh, in uh, infrastructure in both uh, North Sydney and New Waterford, Mr. Speaker, expanding long-term care uh, bed capacity, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, doubling in those uh, communities. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in addition to that, there's expanded uh, investments uh, to uh, upgrade the uh, emergency departments of both uh, Glace Bay and uh, Cape Breton Regional, Mr. Speaker. And that's just some of the investments we're making to support uh, the health care needs of Cape Bretoners. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Mr. Speaker, he says he's going to double the emergency rooms at both those hospitals. They can't keep the ones open they have now, so to double them is not going to do them any good. But let me heighten his awareness, Mr. Speaker, if only that story had ended where it was. Because this young girl is a four-year-old, the doctor that she had seen best thought it would be she should be sedated in order to have this object removed from her eye. He called the regional hospital to get a doctor to sedate her. They didn't have one available. So then the doctor started calling every regional hospital to find someone who could sedate this little girl. And finally, they found someone at the IWK. The family managed to scrape together enough money for the gas and food to bring this little girl to Halifax for a five minute procedure. So will the minister please explain which part of this fiasco meets his standards of acceptable health care in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, as I uh, mentioned in the first question, uh, I'm not aware of the, the specific uh, circumstances that the member uh, has brought to the floor, but uh, what I can uh, advise uh, the member, uh, certainly Mr. Order, Speaker. Please. The Honourable Minister of Health has the floor. Certainly, Mr. Speaker, as a father of four young children. And, uh, being referred to the IWK, I take that, uh, Mr. Speaker, and the services they provide there, recognize top-notch pediatric care, Mr. Speaker, for Nova Scotians, and uh, certainly appreciate the work that's being done there. And any time that uh, my children have been referred up to the IWK, I've taken that, uh, Mr. Speaker, opportunity to uh, to go there and get the care that uh, the health care providers believe is necessary at that uh, facility. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. 
Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of, en of Environment. During one of our many heat waves this summer, the residents of Dartmouth were disappointed to learn that Lake Bannock and Lake Micmac were closed to swimming due to the presence of blue-green algae blooms. Both of these lakes are enjoyed by thousands of people and their pets year-round. They are tourist locations, revenue generators, and a host to world-class international sporting events. These lakes are very important to the people of Dartmouth and beyond. Their closures, because of a potentially serious public health risk, were very disappointing. My question to the Minister is this. What specific action has the Department taken this summer to maintain the health of Dartmouth's lakes? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Acting Minister of the Environment. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and in that regard, uh, the the information that I have at the moment, uh, of course, uh, based uh, heavily upon uh, HRM's responsibility for uh, monitoring uh, the lake uh, in the in, within HRM, uh, is that uh, the current levels are uh, are perfectly fine, and they were for the uh, most recent uh, uh, Canada Pan uh, Am Games that took place uh, in Lake Bannock. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This summer saw many beach closures across the province. Uh, one can only assume, Mr. Speaker, that with climate change, things will continue to heat up and this will only become more problematic. With Lake Bannock hosting the World Canoe Championships and other paddling competitions, it is more important than ever that we have healthy, swimmable lakes. Mr. Speaker, my question uh, is this. What preventative action is being taken by this government to keep our lakes swimmable and open for business for next summer and beyond? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Acting Minister of the Environment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And the member raises uh, an important question. Uh, we know that uh, that uh, because of uh, the extreme uh, heat waves that we've been having uh, uh, during uh, recent summers, uh, the uh, the growth of uh, blue, uh, blue green algae has become uh, uh, problematic. Also, of course, uh, uh, the bacteria counts and so on in the lakes. Uh, I know that uh, provincially. Uh, there is monitoring of uh, uh, those uh, beaches uh, where uh, Nova Scotians uh, are on uh, on a lake uh, on a lake system. Uh, that is carried out through the summer months. In terms of HRM, uh, I would certainly say to the member, uh, we as a department need to work with HRM uh, with uh, those uh, future needs that uh, that the quality of water in the lakes require. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, yesterday, fishers in Port Morion blocked the entrance to the Duncan Mine because they say that the mine's coal shipping plan uh, are going to put lobster, the lobster fishery at risk. This comes after a 200-person meeting uh, of concerned fishers and community members last week. Lobster fisher Don Mes uh, Messenger told media, and I quote, these bays are major breeding grounds. We put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into getting a fisheries, our fisheries into a sustainable state and we could lose everything, Mr. Speaker, and I'll table that. Government has a role to play in coordinating development uh, so that doesn't create jo uh, that uh, creating jobs doesn't create community conflicts uh, between industries. So I'd like to ask the minister, how is the uh, how is he and his government going? Uh, what is he and his government going to do to help bring a resolution uh, to this conflict? The Honourable Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank uh, the member for the question. And uh, we, it, it is true, we have two uh, industries that are very important uh, to our communities that have coexisted for generations. We have hundreds of families who are supported uh, by our very successful fishing industry. And we also have over 125 families directly supported by the mine, not including uh, the, the, the spin-offs that come with it. Um, I've had conversations uh, with the leadership at the mine uh, who have opened up and have been in constant communication with the liaison committee in the community with the fishers uh, and uh, what I've encouraged both groups to do uh, is that we've coexisted for generations get back to the table and talk. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Port Morion community members and others have proposed a solution themselves. Uh, many fishers agree that everyone would be happy to see the coal transported by rail. That's a solution with a little vision and leadership could have various uh, positive spin-offs for Cape Breton, Mr. Speaker. Charlie McLean from the Scotia Rail Development Society said there is a business case uh, for the Cape Breton and Central Nova Rail uh, Scotia Railway and he supported moving the 
coal by rail to the Sydney port. The province still subsidized the rail line owners to keep unused tracks in place to maintain the possibility of a revival. So I'd like to ask the Minister of Business, uh, what is he and his government doing to support the reviving of the Cape Breton and, and Central uh, Nova Scotia Railway, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and uh, thank the member for the question. Uh, obviously, uh, if there was uh, any development on rail, that wouldn't be the, the current owner, Genesee, Wyoming. This would obviously be a new uh, rail line that would go from Duncan to the to the Sydney Piers. But uh, in, in uh, follow-up and support of uh, my colleague, the Minister of Energy and Mines, um, there's a number of options on the table here. We've worked across the across uh, party lines with provincial officials, federal officials. There's lots of conversations here. Uh, the way to get th this done is through diplomacy. We've got to continue the discussions. We don't need uh, anything to derail the conversations that are taking place. So rail and marine and truck, all of these things are options. The discussions are, are happening and unfolding as we speak. And um, we're going to continue that dialogue. We can get to this together. Again, this is mining and fishing. This is what we do best. And uh, we'll make sure we come to the right resolution. So so everyone wins and we continue to build and grow the Cape Breton economy. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sydney River Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, my question through you is to the Minister of Health. Today, Dr. Mark Taylor was available for media interviews about new specialist positions. Three of those positions have been filled, but six are still not. And I guess the Minister will add those six to the more than 130 doctor vacancies already advertised on the NSHA website. People need a family doctor, Mr. Speaker, before they can get a referral to a specialist. My question to the Minister is when there are already scores of doctor vacancies, how does the Minister propose to fill the six specialists announced when he's been unable to, unable to fill the 130 plus that need family doctors. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for drawing attention to this uh, very positive announcement uh, made today in Nova Scotia. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this very positive announcement that uh, shows uh, our commitment uh, to uh, listen to uh, frontline uh, health care workers who identified uh, these as priority areas uh, within the specialty services, Mr. Speaker, to provide uh, top-notch uh, care to Nova Scotians that they need uh, in these uh, specific areas. As the member noted, uh, three of the uh, nine positions have already been recruited. Uh, these positions, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, are, are continuing to be recruited, the other six positions are at various stages. Uh, there's a lot of uh, good uh, uptake and interest in them, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to having them all filled so we can provide these specialist services and health care to all Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Well, you know, uh, I, I'd like to be able to thank the Minister for an answer, but I've never ever gotten one from him, so I wouldn't know what an answer sounded like. <laughs> you know, Mr. Speaker, if today's announcement was actually such great news, it would have been the Minister replying to the media, not Dr. Taylor. Today is just another example of this minister's pattern of pushing responsibility and accountability for health decisions onto others. But Nova Scotians are not fooled, Mr. Speaker. They know the buck stops with this minister. The Premier of Nova Scotia appointed the member for Anakinish, Minister of Health, not Janet Knox. So when is the minister going to take responsibility for the health care crisis in the province of Nova Scotia? The Honourable <laughs> Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and um, I'm amazed, uh, Mr. Speaker, to stand here and respond to a, a member criticizing an investment in, uh, in health care, Mr. Speaker, providing Order specialist out of services. Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Health. An investment, Mr. Speaker, that sees nine uh, new, uh, new specialist positions, Mr. Speaker, to provide care to Nova Scotians. These, these positions, Mr. Order, Speaker. Order, please. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg, will come to order. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. These positions uh, are, are identified, uh, about half for the IWK, Mr. Speaker, providing care, specialist care to our, our youth, Mr. Speaker, uh, in, in the province, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure that member can Order, recognize. Please. 
The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount will come to order. The Honourable Minister of Health. I'm sure even the member opposite, uh, Mr. Speaker, can recognize uh, when a positive thing uh, happens in this province, like this investment. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, as far as... Uh, order, please. The, 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 I, I, <laughs> I really like to ask all members to respect the chair, and if there's a question, please respect the answer. If I have to speak order one more time, we'll be asking for members to leave their seats. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As I said, uh, this investment is positive, Mr. Speaker. I've stated uh, before, Mr. Speaker, that recruitment uh, services are the responsibility of uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority. For the Health Authority to stand up, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, as the, these positions will be providing services there, uh, I think it was very much appropriate that they would be available to speak to the media as well. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, a question for the Minister responsible for tourism in Nova Scotia. Room nights sold are an important measure of success for the tourism season. How is the government measuring them in this era of Airbnb? The Honourable Minister of Business. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the member for the question. Uh, obviously, the shared economy is playing a significant role uh, in room nights and accommodations here in the province, uh, measuring them by way of, of counts the same way that we've done the traditional accommodations. Uh, clearly, it's been something that's been uh, on record and sort of keeping track of in the last couple of years in particular and, and last tourism season. Uh, it's, it's a major conversation right now with, with the Tourism Industry Association of Nova Scotia, Tourism Nova Scotia, and all stakeholders. Um, there's certainly some work to do uh, with respect to the, the the industry and with uh, government policy to ensure that uh, we're reflecting both the need to, to prote protect the investments of traditional accommodations providers and of course uh, realize the reality that the shared economy is here and it'll play a big role in the tourism sector for many years to come and it's important for, to reach uh, the goal set out by the Ivany report. Thank you. Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, the fall tourism conference is approaching and I know the Minister will be there and I want to ask, how will the minister balance the concerns of the licensed accommodation operators who want what they call a fair playing field with the need to allow Airbnb property listers with the ability to grow tourism industry revenues? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the member once again for the question. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the trick, that's the goal, it's, it's balance. Um, the tourism accommodation sector that we have here in the province have uh, put in their blood, sweat, tears, equity, they've taken all the risks to build the tourism sector to where it is today, and we need them and we re rely on them, and they are, are very much a part of, of why we've been so successful in the last number of years. But having said that, Mr. Speaker, uh, the shared economy and the way that it works vis-a-vis -vis online social media and, and the platform that it exists, it, there's no way um, of, of halting that or slowing that down. So regulation is going to be important, taxation, uh, registration, some of the, the monitoring that uh, traditional accommodations providers uh, are subject to, like occupational health and safety and those types of things. Uh, it, it is uh, reflective of a balance, and we've got a committee uh, that's been struck and working on final recommendations so that we do protect the traditional accommodation providers. Thanks. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. My question is for the Premier and his role as Minister of Regula Regulatory Affairs and Service Effectiveness. We all agree that unnecessary red tape hurts Nova Scotian families and businesses every day. This government's Office of Regulatory Affairs and Service Effectiveness is pursuing a target of a net reduction in red tape to the tune of $25 million by the end of this year. They want us to believe that government intends to replace every new dollar in regulatory costs to business with an equal dollar reduction in regulatory costs. However, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business has pointed out that this policy does not apply to, quote, regulatory requirements developed in response to federal initiatives which may significantly add costs and are burden to businesses in Nova Scotia and I'll table that document. My question for the Premier is will the significant cost of cap and trade and the legalization of cannabis be excluded from the red tape reduction efforts of this government? The thank you Mr. Premier. Thank you uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to thank those at the Office of uh, Regulatory Reform Mr. Speaker for the great work they've been doing. Uh, the amount uh, uh, the amount now she's uh, committed to, I think, is over the four-year commitment, Mr. Speaker. I also want to thank those who uh, 
uh, at uh, Canadian Federation of Independent Business, who have been great champions of our government in this province and the great work that has been happening around this file. Uh, we're going to continue to make sure that we move, uh, continue to harmonize the regulations across the region. Very proud of the work we've been able to do internally. Uh, as she would know, uh, we led the charge of ensuring that the regulations around apprenticeships uh, went national. Uh, we're going to continue from our vantage point to ensure uh, that goods and services can flow in and out of our province, that we continue to make sure that our workers who are going to work in the neighbouring province or contractors are being able to do, do in a smooth transition. Uh, and I'm looking forward to continuing to make sure that our voice is heard on the national stage when it comes to regulation. Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, as we know, this government continues to hide their cap-and-trade plan and its true cost to Nova Scotians. Nova Scotians are worried about how much legalization and enforcement of the new cannabis regime will ultimately cost us. Mr. Speaker, these are among several significant costs facing this province, being imposed by this government's friends in the Trudeau government. These plans and their costs will no doubt be accompanied by bales of fresh red tape and this that this government refuses to quantify at this time. Will this government commit today to including the cost of any new federally mandated re regulatory requirements in the red tape reduction. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank uh, the Honourable for the question. I want to thank all those Nova Scotians uh, who over decades have continued to ensure that we do our part to ensure that we uh, continue to improve the environment, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the greenhouse gas reductions, we're leading the country, Mr. Speaker. We're already uh, uh, at uh, 2030 levels where the national government wants us to be below 2005. Uh, we believe we'll continue to be at 50 per cent by, by roughly 2030. Uh, we're looking forward to continuing to make sure that we continue to protect the environment in our province. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, I think it's important that the Honourable Member understands that this government has made sure that when the plan was put together, that the hard work that Nova Scotians have already committed to is reflected in our plan. Mr. Speaker, I've come out very clearly. Uh, we're opposed to a carbon tax in our province, and we're going to continue please. to make sure that we... Time allotted for oral questions put by members.